Doctor, so the, the question is, they've seen a lot of dermatologists and trichologists and cosmetologists say that oiling the scalp feeds bacteria that live on the scalp that lead to scalp issues and can also block hair follicles resulting in alopecia. So the question, there's a broader question around, should we oil? Should we not oil our scalp? I've seen, personally, I've seen chemists say yes. I've seen chemists say no. I think, you know, so is there any, um, from your perspective, um, oiling the scalp? You kind of talked about a little bit about the hair, but what about the scalp? Yeah. So I don't oil my scalp. However, there are people who have beautiful hair with no issues who do. And because we are all individuals, that goes to the personalization aspect mm -hmm. of how we need to answer this question. So usually I say, no, you don't need to oil your, oil your scalp. But if you live in Arizona, I talked about this earlier, mm -hmm. and your skin is dry, and your scalp is dry and you feel that that soothes your skin and you don't have any adverse effects, mm -hmm. I don't see a problem with you doing it. Now, I wouldn't say, oh yeah, everybody <laughs> needs to do it, mm -hmm. but I would say you usually don't have to do it unless you are in an environment which requires mm -hmm. you to do it just to be comfortable. Now, I said earlier that I suffer from seborrheic dermatitis. Mm -hmm. I don't need those oils because the yeast that feeds, <laughs> that exacerbates the problem, mm -hmm. the malassezia yeast loves to eat on that. And so I make my problem worse when I okay. do that. But that's specific to me. Right. And so it depends, but for the most part, most people do not have to oil their scalp. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. So the next question is around um, the use of minoxidil or Rogaine mm -hmm. um, from just from a scientific, scientific perspective. Actually, minoxidil is Rogaine the, it's the brand layman's, name for layman's term for? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes, so the brand the, of minoxidil. Okay. Yeah, so um, the science says that for non-scarring alopecia, I shouldn't say not all, well, for most non-scarring alopecias that it seems to be effective in helping the hair to grow. However, not everything is 100%. And usually you get better results when it's combined with another type of treatment as well. So mm. it depends. Mm -hmm. And um, I, to be honest, when you implement mm -hmm. that as a strategy, I would definitely go and see a dermatologist and be guided mm -hmm. with someone who really knows about right. hair loss issues. Mm -hmm. um, I, oh, go ahead. I would say I, I talked about that with my dermatologist and, and she mentioned that if you take it, you more than likely will need to continue to take it sort of. You know, mm -hmm. and and we kind of made the decision. We won't. Let's not do it right now. Not that I would never do it, but let's just not. Let's hold off right now and let's try these other you know options. Um, so that was one of the reasons why I personally chose not to use it at the time. But it is data that shows that it is effective and it is FDA approved. Yes. So the FDA does approve minoxidil as a treatment for non-scarring hair loss. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and that's important though, you said non-scarring. So that's the other part. People need to make sure they work with their dermatologists. Well, so- not, not buy it over the counter with, you know, self-treating. Well, you, you can. So sometimes there's a long delay mm -hmm. in getting to see a dermatologist. True. And because <laughs> you can true. buy minoxidil over the counter, you, why not? Mm -hmm. You really have nothing to lose, especially if you- can start to reverse the hair loss. The hair loss. So it's nothing wrong with starting off on on your own. Mm -hmm. I mean, they do offer it over the counter, so why not? Um, but I, I would say to optimize the results while you're waiting <laughs> to see mm -hmm. a dermatologist, you can do it. Um, but you're right; you you do have to continue to do it. Um, and I I don't have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. If there is something that's going on with my body. 
Right. And exactly. I need to continue to do whatever it is that's going to help my body to mm -hmm. be optimized and work the way it should. I don't see a problem doing yeah. that. Yeah. Well, yeah. some of us do it, we're doing it with something. So maybe it's a supplement. So you're still, whatever it is you're taking breakfast, I'm, I take turmeric. I've been taking it since I'm going to keep taking it. So if I were to, I'm, I'm okay with that as well. Like I'm okay with, if I need to take it to help the healing process, whatever it is, whether it's medication or a supplement, I personally don't have a problem <laughs> with. Now, I also want to talk about scarring because I did specify that it helps with non-scarring, but with scarring alopecia, and there are several types that's beyond the scope of what we're talking about, but if you do suffer from scarring alopecia, a lot of times the follicle that is scarred over is sitting next to a follicle that is not scarred. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to make sure that that follicle, the follicle that is vibrant and, and still working, mm -hmm. you want to allow it to continue to function. And so using something like minoxidil mm -hmm. can help prevent the scar, the non-scarred follicles from scarring over. That's the first time I've heard that. And so yeah. you, you want to make sure that even though it may not help with the follicles that mm -hmm. no longer produce hair, it will help to camouflage. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, keep those follicles viable. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. That's good. Good information. Um, and you talked about washing your hair. You Essentially, you said, someone asked, how should we be washing our hair? Um, mm -hmm. And does it vary depending on the texture? Someone asked oh. me. Mm -hmm. So there is research that has come out that ideally it is best to cleanse your hair once a week, if you can. Mm -hmm. Once a week is ideal. If you have to stretch it out to two weeks, okay, but, you know, um, ideally once a week. And usually, so I, I don't fix what's not broken. Mm -hmm. There have been years that we have cleansed our hair every other week and have not had any problems. But if you're starting to have problems, increasing the frequency will help. Mm -hmm. um, but it just helps to reset so that you can get that balance. So we talked about the microbiome. You want the environment of the microbes and, you know, people are always saying, oh, it fights bacteria, it fights all this. And I tell people all the time, you're disrupting the normal flora of the environment. So mm. seeing that you're using something that's antibacterial isn't necessarily the, the solution to the problem. You want a healthy balance and we're still learning what that healthy balance is, mm -hmm. but um, it's not always about, um, it, it, it's a reset to make right. sure that there isn't what we call dysbiosis, meaning right. that you have an offset of the balance. And so then it's going to negatively impact the health of your scalp. You yeah. want that balance. Absolutely. I find I, can, I can't go more than seven days without having, it starts itching or start like I know I have to wash within five to seven days or it's just not pretty <laughs> and that's you listening to your body and that's really what's important to be honest with you <laughs> we as women in particular um we have a habit of of suffering mm -hmm. for the sake of beauty mm -hmm. and we need to start listening to our bodies more <laughs> and do what's right so I, I take it the itching goes away when you cleanse it, right? 100%. Okay. <laughs> 100%. Okay. That is what's right for your body. And some people can go every other week and be fine. Right. right. And if that works for them, that's fine. But as soon as you start experiencing problems, right. it's time to change things up. Especially as we get older, our bodies do not work as efficiently as they used to. <sighs> <laughs> Now that is the truth. Yes. And so sometimes we have to nurse our bodies, you know, to be as optimal in that snap in time or that uh, snapshot right. in time that, that we can. Right. And it also speaks to, I know we've done a lot of science, a lot of psychology and a lot of even the things on their channel. It also, we also just talk about life. Like it also is just about, you said it best, like listen to your body. Like we need to slow down. We need to you know, take a minute, take a breather. There's so many other things that can contribute to it. And 
you know, and get out of this hustle culture. I got to do all the 20,000 things. And anyway, that's a whole nother conversation, but I think there's a connection there too with that. Mm -hmm. So one person asked about, and we just have a few more, um, your thoughts, do you have any thoughts on frontal fibrosing alopecia and is it possible to grow your hair back? Um, mm -hmm. So that's a scarring alopecia. Mm -hmm. And um, once again, sometimes the follicles that are scarred over are next to neighboring follicles that have not been scarred over. And so when you say reverse, I mean, if your follicle is no longer going to grow hair, then it's not going to grow hair anymore. Okay. Mm -hmm. But if you are one of the fortunate ones and you have those neighbors that are viable, those viable follicles, then you can camouflage and actually kind of offset the appearance of mm -hmm. that hair loss. So it depends. <laughs> it depends on the severity. Right, right. So, you know, if it's just starting and you're able to stop that inflammation and start to regrow the follicles that haven't scarred over, then it may look like, you know, it's recovered. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But sometimes that's not possible. Possible. And that, that leads actually into the next question, which is, um, it sounds like it's similar, but with a different alopecia. So the person suffered from a scarring alopecia, actually, this might be the same question. She did some PRP, um, but it just, the treatment was four months um, and it didn't necessarily come back. And the question was, should she continue or is there another way to help, to help her? Knowing this, you cannot diagnose someone, you know, from a question. So I was just getting ready yes. to say, I am not qualified yeah. to answer yeah. that question. Yeah, I was like, it might just they have, might have to find another dermatologist or trichologist, you know, partnership to. It's always good to have a, a second opinion. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, there, like I said, there are those who specialize in particular types of hair loss. Mm -hmm. So getting an opinion from someone who is an expert in that particular hair loss would, would yeah. really be beneficial. So, Yep. And this next one, again, that was actually these are all aligned with um, having hair grow back. And this person asked about having hair grow back from CCCA and they ask how, but I feel like our, a common theme of our discussion is around, it depends, right? <laughs> and, and getting treatment from those areas, because from my perspective, someone, yeah, I, it can grow back. Cause I was diagnosed with early scarring. You know, it's all my, this whole thing was gone. Mm. It wasn't completely all like I had little, but it was, it was becoming, it was, it was on its way there. So as a, as a patient, I can say that. So I think, but any, anything you'd like to share from your perspective around um, growing back? Yeah, um, no, <laughs> because that caveat of it depends. Yeah, yeah. It really depends on the individual. I mean, I, I'm glad to hear that you have changed up your diet to incorporate turmeric, which is anti-inflammatory. Um, people don't realize just how lifestyle changings can work wonders. Mm -hmm. And people are always trying to put a topical on to solve the problem when in actuality, like I said, our bodies don't work as efficiently as they used to. Mm -hmm. And from all the different areas <laughs> of mm -hmm. biology mm -hmm. that you can help to support your, your mm -hmm. systems, biology, that is, mm -hmm. it, it's nothing wrong with, uh, being holistic in, in your approach mm -hmm. and trying to solve the, the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so, then how can you maintain a healthy scalp with CCC? And you've kind of talked about scalp health in general, but do you have any thoughts on the, on that one? Yeah. Um, like you said, dietary changes. Um, but all, so we talk about anti-inflammatories a lot, but we don't talk about the inflammation. Um, <laughs> there are, I mean, the sad diet, the standard American diet that we incorporate into our lifestyle does not help us at all. And so um, there are inflammatory foods that can probably, I mean, this hasn't been studied because our system's biology is so complicated and it's very difficult to study human beings. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And so a lot of times they use, you know, animal models to understand um, mm -hmm. if there are going to be um, changes based on regulating or having a controlled experiment. Um, but you cannot go wrong <laughs> with um, eliminating some of those inflammatory foods, you know, and we know that sugar, yep, unhealthy fats. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. we already know this. Right. right. And I, I would have to say that if we had a healthier diet, that would help us a lot. It will give the opportunities of the treatments that are um, known to work. Mm -hmm. It gives it a mm -hmm. better chance of working. And mm -hmm. so I think that that is extremely important. Yeah. Now, the other thing you asked about was? Um, maintaining a healthy scalp with CCCA. Oh, cleansing mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I, I would go so far to say that cleansing more frequently, even mm -hmm. so if you wear your hair short, and you cleanse like every three to four days, that would be great if you can do that. Mm -hmm. But um, cleansing is very important. And, and of course, consistency in following up and using the treatments right. that are given to you. I cannot tell you how many times I hear that people just aren't compliant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They just don't do what they should be doing. Mm -hmm. to do. It's extremely important. Yeah, I think the three to five, I also remember I went through a season when I was doing it, washing my hair like every three to four days or five days. And I, if I recall, I think it grew better even then. I went to seven. Anyway, you're making me think about <laughs> switching up my sort of process a little bit. And um, this is anecdotal. So I have um, heard and, well, so people who have, had clients to change where they've increased their cleansing frequency, they've mm -hmm. had better responses than those who don't. Yeah. So yeah. It's it's anecdotal, but I would be willing to bet that if there, but my hypothesis is right. that <laughs> right. if you increase your cleansing frequency, that you will also increase the rate of recovery. Okay. Got it. Okay. Three more and we're gonna be done. So the one is castor oil. So this person said, I've seen, um, I started to see more growth and thickening after using castor oil and some earlier creams, but still not able to really thicken the crown. Um, do you have any suggestions? And as there's a, I know castor oil is like the big bad word in the community around. There's like the camp that is don't ever touch it. And then there's the camp it, that it's everything that I need. So where do you fall in the castor oil um, and and the and any and things that might be able to use again from a scientific perspective to help thicken hair. There is no data that shows that ca castor oil is effective. Mm -hmm. um, personally, I don't like castor oil because I don't like the aesthetics of it. It, okay. I, I mean, it's very viscous, meaning that it's what people would call thick. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I don't like the consistency of it. It holds on to, you know, dirt. And so it is like, mm, no. Um, so I don't like it. I would never tell people to use it for hair loss. But um, there are people, like you said, who swear by it. And I, I just say that I don't fix, I mean, I don't fix what's not broken. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so if you have found that that works for you um, and you are at a standstill, then I would seek the advice of a dermatologist for mm -hmm. other, other things that you can do <laughs> to, help Try to yeah, get to the areas that haven't filled in. But if it's scarred, um, then that may be problematic. But I believe that there is an opportunity for hair to grow if you get the right, right. the right treatment. Yeah. There was a um a dermatologist that I saw on TikTok, and she said, you know, similar like there's no scientific evidence. And the comment section from people was like they lit her up in terms of like it worked for me, it worked for me. So I one of my questions when I saw all that because I heard the science side of it, and then I saw all the comments. And I thought what we really need, quite frankly, is a study 
Because we can say that there, the science doesn't say that, but has the science studied it? I agree 100%, you know? which is one of the reasons <laughs> why I collaborate with hair practitioners who want to be a part of scientific yeah. studies because not all practitioners have the same regimen mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. procedures. And if you are a practitioner who says, hey, my castor oil works because mm -hmm. a lot of practitioners sell their own products. Right, 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 right. I want to study that. Right. I get data behind the products or the methodologies that you use to help with hair loss. Right. That is one of the things that I am like all about because I have seen some trichologists work what I consider miracles. Mm -hmm. It is awesome. And some aren't. Right. So why is that? So that, that and, exactly. That's yeah. my question because I I I I I fall between I just like like I said I feel like we're we have a lot of I've heard you know it doesn't it doesn't but how do we know it doesn't Let's take that back it's hard to tell somebody what doesn't work when they're telling you that it does it's also hard to work to say how it's working when it works for this person but not for that person right so how do we get <laughs> the answer so well, that is why I partner with hair practitioners mm -hmm. because it's important to get the data right. and to know. And, and I try to advocate for that. I'm, I'm right. like, we are in, in my opinion, we have a more sophisticated consumer base. Yes. We are reading, unfortunately, the wrong things a lot yeah. of times, but we have people who desire to have the information, but mm -hmm. it's not out there. Mm -hmm. And personally, I like, especially as a scientist, I like to make informed decisions. Mm -hmm. So I'm all about the data. Like I, th mm -hmm. there are people always trying to say, oh, try this supplement. I'm like, mm, I'm mm -hmm. real mm -hmm. leery about the supplements mm -hmm. because they don't have to prove that their stuff works. They don't right. have to prove right. that their stuff is safe. They are supposedly, you know, the right. honor system, right. right? but they're not, it's not enforced. Right. And so I don't try, I mean, yeah, no, <laughs> can't handle that. So I say all that to say, same with, with supplements. Mm -hmm. I want to see the data before I start implementing anything be. And, and, the, and think the same should be true for products. Product. Exactly. And I, I agree with that in terms of even for supplements, when I chose to do them, from personally, I I went to the National Institute for Health. Like I went, I I'm getting my doctorate in education, so I'm reading the studies. I'm learning about how to do the method, understand the methodology, the hypothesis. So personally, that was my ownership of. And I'm going to take it, you know, and I'm going to make sure they're third party tested. But not everybody can do that or does that. And that I'm not saying that people have to do that, but yes, they do. do. Own, they should. We have to own, like we have to own. Um be advocates for ourselves and, yes. and, um, own some of that educational process. So. Absolutely. But we're looking as consumers, right. we're looking exactly. and it's not there. Right. That's the issue, which is right. why I'm like, come on, let's get some data. <laughs> I mean, so as a trichologist, if you're putting trichologist after your name and you really stand on science, because right. that's what trichology is. So why wouldn't you get the data behind what you're doing. 100%. That 100%. just makes sense to me. And so I try to do it in a more economical way because it costs a lot of money to do clinical studies. Yeah, I and, can imagine. <laughs> and there are things that you can do to get the data and not have to have that level of expense. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's what I do. Awesome. Okay. So the last question is around um, their red light laser therapy um, from your perspective, because there is um, people that are using it for CCCA. Um, so what are your thoughts around red light laser therapy? Yeah. So and if you have any recommendations, if you are a proponent of it, if you have any recommendations, if not, that's fine. So there are several brands that do have data to show Mm -hmm. that using, I'm going to say low light laser therapy, mm -hmm. th there is data to show that it works, mm -hmm. but not 100%. Okay. <laughs> like with anything. I mean, with, like, 
minoxidil, that's not 100% either. Right, right. So there is evidence that it does work, um, but not all the time. And there aren't any brands that I advocate for. But um, yes, what I would say is for anything, make sure you're making an informed decision. So make sure you ask for the data. So you were saying not everyone ha- has to do that. And yes, I think everyone does have to do that. <laughs> um, and so yeah. look to make sure that they have the data mm-hmm. and that they're transparent. If right. they don't have the data run, right. um, you want someone who is transparent about what it is and knowledgeable about what they're using and why. Mm-hmm. Always ask for the data. Mm-hmm. Always. <laughs> Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And if they don't have it, because there are so many that are producing the data, those mm-hmm. are the ones that I would be more trusting of. Okay. And then you have to just kind of see for yourself. It really is at this point until we as scientists can understand how to personalize it a little bit more, when we have more of an understanding and can say, okay, people of who, who, have these particular characteristics that are going on with them, they are more responsive to this particular treatment. Right. So we get to that point. Right. And it is um, trial and error. Um, but I see that process changing, I'd say in the next 10 years, I think there will be more research to help guide a little bit better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 